Good morning, Northport. Welcome to Northport Community United Church of Christ. No matter where you are in life's journey, you're always welcome here, and I do mean that. You're always welcome here. If you have a cell phone, would you mind turning it off or silencing it? Because the message that we have up here is more important than what's on that. Uh, the attendance books, would you mind signing them and passing them on and then send them back? Uh, there are many meetings scheduled this week. Please check your bulletin for times and dates. Please join us in coffee hour at fellowship after the service. Today there's a jar on the beverage table donated donations for the Holy Joe Cafe. The August newsletter will be printed and picked up, pick up a copy in the narthex. There's a memorial service for Jim Ramsey at 11 o'clock on Tuesday morning. And if you don't know who Jim Ramsey is, you haven't gone here very long. Because everybody knew Jim Ramsey. Uh, there will be a Bible, no Bible study this week because of that. Uh, the woman's breakfast is this week on Wednesday. Please sign up in Fellowship Hall. And even if you haven't signed up, just show up. We have some announcements. Esther? Good morning. I have some really exciting news. We will have, we, that means our church, will have a new pictorial directory early next year. So we're planning picture taking this fall so please set aside the dates of August the 21st, which is a Friday. Uh, sorry, August, never mind. October the 21st, <laughs> which is a Friday. And October the 20, it says October here. I just, you know. October the, how, there's a lot of days I wake up and I say, well, let's see, what month is this? What day is it? Well, uh, the day I can sort of get because I work Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So that's easy. And I go to church on Sunday. But it's that other stuff, you know, where you don't have a season, no snow, you can't figure out what, what it is. So we'll start with this. We will have a new pictorial directory early next year, so we're planning picture taking this fall. Please set aside October the 21st, which is a Friday, in the afternoon, and, Octo and October the 22nd, which is a Saturday in the daytime, for your photo shoot here at the church. This means the picture should be ready for Christmas, we will give you more information when it comes in and when it gets closer to the date. The people that you're wanting, if you have some questions on what's happening and what if I'm not going to be here and all that kind of stuff, Patty has a lot of answers, Becky has a lot of answers, and I have a lot of answers. So any of those three people, and Barbara is one of our helpers too, and you know Becky, she's going to be saying, well, who else is going to help? So when she walks your way, smile and say, yes, what can I do? Okay, thank you. We need boo for the jingle bells. Good morning, I'm back. Me too. Good Lord gave me another day. Inside your bulletins today, you're going to find a little insert for the Jingle Bell Committee. We're starting to gather our thoughts and ideas for this year's decorating. We're looking for your thoughts and ideas that you personally have that you'd like to see, anything different or something you didn't like last year. Please write them down, throw that in the offering plate, and we'll take all that into consideration. Thank you. All right, Norma. You don't want to come up here? Okay. There's a table up here. There's a mission meeting tomorrow morning. Is that 10 o'clock? 11 o'clock, sorry. I'm not going to be here. Lunch following. See, you should have just stood up here and done this. That's okay. Are there any other announcements? Do we have any first-time visitors? Everybody's here, knows the routine. Uh, I have one more announcement. This is the last Sunday for our guest organist, Carolyn 
Ellington. We have appreciated her willing for helping us out for the last three months. We have thoroughly enjoyed your music and hope to see you back to fill in again sometimes. Thank you again. Great. We really do appreciate her. Let us be at worship. I just would like to say a few words. I'm a little emotional this morning, but I just wanted to thank you all for your warmth, for hospitality, for supporting me, for making me feel so at home here. You're a wonderful congregation. You have a great minister. And where's my Patty? I could not have done it without her. She kept me on hymns. She kept me on regularities of the church, the order of worship, and she was always there for us up here. And so I really appreciate it. And I might add that a couple of weeks ago, I had a request for a special song. And I was talking to Patty about when she thought I should do it. She said, oh, that's one that our choirs like, our bells like, and our congregation likes. So it is really with uh, great pleasure that I've been able to, to play this for you again. It's called I'll Fly Away. And I believe it was Jeannie and Larry that uh, requested it. And it's one of my favorite, too. And I got to thinking about it. And this being my last Sunday, it's kind of appropriate. I'll fly away. <laughs> but I hope to be back. Fly back. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And God bless you all. Thank you.
Good morning, and thank you very much for uh, that uh, very appropriate prelude this morning. Ezekiel 36, 26 says, And I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. Um, let us stand and worship with the first song, No Matter. From east to west, our mighty God calls us together. Our God comes to us to bring justice to all people. The kind of worship I want, God says, is a thankful heart and a commitment to do my will. in the back of the hymn book. Oh. Oh. I don't see any children here this morning, so I'm going to do my children's message anyway. Um, what's that? All children. All right. Okay. So I heard a really neat story uh, a couple weeks ago that I thought was worthwhile maybe sharing with the kids today. You know, there are so many people that serve our community in so many different ways and people that do things for us. And, uh, you know, I just um, uh, thought this was really a neat, a neat story. And so many people in our community do not know that they're loved by God, right? Um, that they um, need to hear that message, but it's a key how we are delivering that message. So how many of you have plenty of garbage around your house? <laughs> I didn't say in the house, I said around your house. 
Well, I, I waited uh, purposefully till a little bit later on to pull this thing in here that we call a garbage can. And hi, Alton. How are you feeling? Good, good. Here, I have a chair for you. Look. There you go. Take a seat. And uh, um, so every week, um, when is garbage day here in Northport? Thursday, Tuesday, okay, different, different days of the week. But anyway, you know which day it is, right? And so the night before, people put out their garbage cans, and faithfully, uh, the garbage truck shows up, and uh, there's typically one who drives the truck, and then one or two people that are on the back of the truck who empty the garbage can. And we would be in big trouble here in Florida if they wouldn't do that regularly because of the heat, the smell, and uh, all around. Well, I heard the story about this lady who decided she was going to do something nice for the guys that pick up her garbage. So she wrote a letter, and in that letter she said, Dear Mr. Garbage Man, because she didn't know his name, obviously, she said, I want you to know that I so appreciate, and it's very important to me that every week you pick up my garbage. And I can imagine that this is a pretty tough job that you do, and um, I wanted you to know that I appreciate what you do. And with the letter, she put in a $50 bill and said, I want you to go out to have a good meal with your loved one, with your family, and I want this as a token of my appreciation for your service to our family every week. And then um, she also ent uh, gave a little booklet that explained the love of God. Now, the little booklet is very important because it really talks about the main message. And the main message is that God loves us and that he had that message for this person that picked up her garbage every week. But I don't think that that leaflet would have been appreciated or accepted as openly and lovingly probably as it did with the gift together. Does that make sense? It's like, oh, here, God loves you, but I have nothing for you. And when we share the love of God with people, we have to somehow find a vehicle, somehow find a way to make that happen. And a matter of fact, I know Alton was in the hospital and he had surgery. And the way how um, we um, support each other in times of need is not just to say, oh, Alton, God loves you or whoever, but we also have to find the right vehicle to express that love. And one way could be to pick up the phone and call and see how the person is doing. Another one is to write a card to tell them you are appreciated. Um, another one would be like this lady did. Um, she said, here, I want you to know I appreciate the hard work that you do for our family. I know your job isn't easy. I want you to know that I acknowledge that. Here is a gift and here is a message about God's love. How many in our community need to know that they're loved? really loved, unconditionally loved. And that's how God loves us in an unconditional way, which is really mind-blowing if you think about it, because that's for everyone without exception. So Alton, I'm so glad you came. I'm so glad you're doing better, and I really like your T-shirt. <laughs> Raptors, huh? Okay. All right. Well, thanks for being such a good listener. And let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for Alton and his health and that he is recovering completely from that surgery that he had. And we just pray, Lord, as our kids are getting ready to go back to school, that you prepare them for that and the teachers and um, all the preparations that go into that. And we worship you and thank you for your love that is indeed unconditional. And we can't wrap our minds uh, around that completely, but we're trying to understand it anyway. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so I'm going to remove this now. Okay. Thank you for being so patient. I want to read to you a passage of scripture here from uh, 
the book of Ruth, Ruth chapter 2. How many of you know the story of Ruth in the Bible? Ruth. And who can tell me what happened uh, in the story of Ruth? What was going on there? Anybody? Her husband died, that's right. And she had a mother-in-law, right? And she, uh, what did she do? What did Ruth do? She stayed with her mother-in-law. And in Ruth chapter 2, which um, Norma a while ago referred to, um, there is a very interesting verse that goes in line with our celebrations and concerns this morning. That's why I'm reading this. It says, just then Boaz arrived from Bethlehem. He said to the harvesters, may the Lord be with you. And they said to him, may the Lord bless you. Boaz said to this young man, uh, uh, to his young men, um, the one who was overseeing the harvesters, to whom does this young woman belong? The young man who was overseeing the harvesters answered, she's a young Moabite woman, meaning she was a um, uh, Gentile, um, a non-believer. Uh, at least uh, from the eyes of the Jewish uh, people, the one who returned with Naomi from the territory of Moab. She said, please let me glean so that I might uh, gather up grain from among the bundles behind the harvesters. She arrived and has been on her feet from morning until now and has sat down for only a moment. Boaz said to Ruth, haven't you understood, my daughter? Don't go glean in another field. Don't go anywhere else. Instead, stay here with my uh, young woman, uh, women. I'm sorry. Keep your eyes on the field that they are harvesting and go along after them. I've ordered the young men not to assault you. Whether you are thirsty, go to the jugs and drink from what the young men have filled. Then she bowed down, face to the ground, and replied to him, How is it that I have found favor in your eyes that you notice me? I am an immigrant. Boaz responded to her, Everything that you did for your mother-in-law after your husband's death has been reported fully to me, how you left behind your father, your mother, and the land of your birth, and came to a people you hadn't known beforehand. May the Lord reward you for your deed, May you receive a rich reward from the Lord, the God of Israel. And here's the key. That's why I'm reading this. Under whose wings you have come to seek refuge. So what he's saying here is that you are not expecting your help from people, but you have come under the wings of God and you have sought refuge underneath those wings. Is there anybody here who is seeking refuge and strength under the protection of God's wings? That's what we're doing when we're praying. That's what we're doing when we're seeking his face on Sunday morning. So is there anybody here who wants to be blessed? Anybody? Okay, anybody has a birthday? Oh, Marvin. When is your birthday? Uh, yesterday. Yesterday. Okay. Hey, well, God bless you on your birthday. That's wonderful. Anybody else? Oh, that's right. I heard about that. When is your birthday? Happy birthday. <laughs> okay. Two. Oh, okay. Wow. What, an, what a milestone. That's great. <laughs> All right. Anybody else who is celebrating a birthday? Or anything else? Well, if not, then let's sing happy birthday to them, please. So now it's time to uh, call out our prayer requests that we have. What are we praying for? Go ahead. Lord, 
So we need to pray for Michael and his healing, absolutely. Anybody else? What else are we praying for? Go ahead. Yes, praise God, praise God. Yes. Go ahead. Mark, yes, we'll pray for the family with that unexpected and sudden loss, absolutely. Any other prayer requests that we have this morning? How many of you have an unspoken request? Okay, a lot of us do have unspoken requests. Well, let's stand. Hold your neighbor's hand, and we're going to pray together. Lord, a moment ago in the beginning of our service, we heard that uh, come to us, we have the answers. We have answers for you. Well, that's kind of like you calling out uh, to us uh, right now. Come to me, all you who are uh, weary and heavy uh, laden and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. We thank you for that promise. Uh, we thank you that you will undertake on behalf of all these prayer requests. We praise you for lives protected. We praise you for surgeries that have gone well. We praise you, Lord, already for the outcome of other treatments that are still being administered. Uh, we thank you for every hand that has gone up and in faith said, I cannot share it with everybody here. It's uh, not for everybody to know, but uh, you know about it, Lord. And we pray that you uh, just make all the difference um, that's needed in that circumstance and that situation. We thank you for birthdays that we're celebrating. We thank you, Lord, that we can be in your presence this morning and that you have surely a message for your people. And we thank you um, that you love us and that your love is real. And we pray this humbly in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So at this time, we uh, gather our tithes and offerings. And then we will go um, into a prayer dedication and then the scripture reading.
<clears throat> oh Lord God, we realize that we live in a world where uh, the need of your message of um, um, that protection under your wings and also uh, about your great and unconditional love towards your people needs to be heard in this world. And we pray that uh, we, in everything that we do, that that might happen through our ministry here. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. You may be seated. Okay, so I'm going to read today from the Common English Bible, and we are continuing in our series on the life of Joseph. So if you brought your Bible, you can follow along, but you can also read it on the screen. So Joseph reveals his identity. Joseph could no longer control himself in front of all his attendants, so he declared, everyone leave now. So no one stayed with him when he revealed his identity to his brothers. He wept so loudly that the Egyptians and Pharaoh's household heard him. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father really still alive? His brothers couldn't respond because they were terrified before him. Joseph said to his brothers, come closer to me, and they moved closer. He said, I'm your brother, Joseph, the one you sold to Egypt. Now don't be upset and don't be angry with yourselves that you sold me here. Actually, God sent me before you to save lives. We've already had two years of famine in the land, and there are five years left without planting or harvesting. God sent me before you to make sure you would survive and to rescue your lives in this amazing way. You didn't send me here. It was God who made me a father to Pharaoh, master of his entire household, and ruler of the whole land of Egypt. Hurry, go back to your father. Tell him this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me master of all of Egypt. Come down to me, don't delay. You may live in the land of Goshen, so you will be near me, your children, your grandchildren, your flocks, your herds, and everyone with you. I will support you there, so you, your household, and everyone with you won't starve since the famine um, will still last five years. You and my brother Benjamin have seen with your own eyes that I'm, speak that I'm speaking to you. Tell my father about my power in Egypt and about everything you've seen. Hurry and bring my father down here. Uh, he threw his arms around his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, and Benjamin wept on his shoulder. He kissed all of his brothers and wept, embracing them. After that, his brothers were finally able to talk to him. When Pharaoh's household heard the message, Joseph's brothers have arrived. Both uh, Pharaoh and his servants were pleased. Pharaoh said to Joseph, give your brothers uh, these instructions. Load your pack animals and go back to the land of Canaan. Get your father and your household um, and come back to me. Let me provide you with good things from the land of Egypt so that you may eat the land's best food. Give them these instructions too. Take wagons from the land of Egypt for your children and wives and pick up your father and come back. Don't worry about your possessions because you will have good things from the entire land of Egypt. So Israel's sons did that. Joseph gave them wagons as Pharaoh instructed, and he gave them provisions for the road. And to all of them, he gave a change of clothing. But to Benjamin, he gave 300 pieces of silver and five changes of clothing. To his father, he sent 10 male donkeys carrying goods from Egypt, 10 female donkeys carrying grain and bread, and rations for his um, father for the road. He sent his brothers off, and as they were leaving, he told them, don't be worried about the trip. So they left Egypt and returned to their father Jacob in the land of Canaan. They announced to him, Joseph's still alive, and he's actually ruler of all the land of Egypt. Jacob's heart nearly failed, and he didn't believe them. When they told him everything, Joseph had said to them, and when he saw the wagons Joseph had sent to carry him, Jacob recovered. Then Israel said, this is too much. My son Joseph is still alive. Let me go and see him before I die. So far, God's word. Let's close our eyes and turn to God in prayer one more time before we get into our message. Lord God, we um, thank you for the story of Joseph, and we thank you that indeed this story has to do uh, with our lives. Um, it's been written so long ago, yet we can identify with it. Um, our lives um, are truly um, under the protection of your wings. We are counting on that protection, and we need your blessing. We've heard these prayer requests that are 
uh, called out um, in our midst here. The needs are so manifold. Uh, human answers would never suffice or be enough. Um, but your answer, your light, um, your peace, and um, your grace in the midst of all those circumstances will make a difference. We put aside anything that disturbs us now or would get our attention away from your word and ask you to teach us with the might of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. All right, so if you were here um, last week, you remember that uh, Joseph had a last test for his brothers. Um, that's what we learned last Sunday. There was the silver cup um, that he placed, um, his personal cup that he placed into Benjamin's bag. And Benjamin is therefore in a precarious situation over which Joseph has full control. This is the golden opportunity for the brothers to have Benjamin enslaved. Will they betray Rachel's other son as well? Or maybe even believe that he stole that cup? Or will they do something else? Uh, it's a big question mark. Judah is there, who had uh, long ago suggested selling Joseph rather than killing him. And he becomes the spokesperson in the setting, if you remember. He claims their innocence um, in this matter, but he acknowledges their guilt in another, in a matter that has followed them all these years, over two decades, um, and that was the guilt towards Joseph. And we said and established that um, there is a tangible change in Judah. He had a changed heart. He was ready uh, over two decades ago to sell a younger brother into slavery, but now he's willing to enslave himself for another favored little brother. He's ready to pay the highest price, bring the highest sacrifice, and we referred to a scripture out of the New Testament where we said that we know someone's love um, by their manner of sacrifice, that they're willing to lay down their life for another person, which is Judah is doing here. He's offering himself in the place of Benjamin. And um, in this process, we have seen how not just Judah, but really all of them have become changed people over these two decades and more. And the closing thought, this is what we finished up with in case you weren't here. We can see how Joseph learned to interpret his circumstances by um, God's love and not the other way around. And that means he does not interpret God's love by his circumstances. And we must learn to do the same thing. And that's a hard lesson for all of us. In Psalm 119, 105, um, we said that this is what the scripture declares to us. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. We see clearer. Um, our, our soul lightens, our heart um, um, the burden is lifted from our heart when we see the light of God shine into our circumstances. So Joseph, now this is how far we went last week, but Joseph can't last any longer. He breaks down emotionally, and through tears he reveals himself to his brothers in their own language. So here are his brothers, prostrate uh, on their faces um, towards him, and he breaks down in front of them. Uh, they don't know yet about his forgiveness. Um, all they have seen um, so far in Egypt was the constant threat and death or prison. Now they think they know um, what was going on. Um, he Well, okay, meaning that he was tormenting them, so to speak, because uh, one test after another. Let's read Genesis 45, 3. It says, Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father really still alive? His brothers couldn't respond because they were terrified of him. So that's, that's the point I wanted to make, and I got stuck there, that, that they were terrified of him because they didn't know where this was going to lead. Yes, he's revealing himself. Yes, he's saying, I am Joseph, your brother, but now what? But now what? And you know, this whole thing about him breaking down and crying out was a cry from the gut. This was no little whimper. This was no little, 
you know, whining or crying or shedding of silent tears, but it says that it echoed through the streets of Egypt. That's the kind of cry this was. And if you have ever lost a loved one that you were really close with, and you stood at the casket of that person, and you cried like that, you know what the scripture is talking about. Why is he crying like that? I'll tell you why. Because all that stuff that had to be stuffed in for the last 20 some years is now coming out. Is now need to be released. And again, the brothers do not know where this is going to leave. But Joseph gives them assurance that his intentions are good. Let me tell you something. Our God wants you to win, not to lose. He's not after you to punish you, but he's after you to make you win. He wants you to get across that finish line. He wants you to make it. He wants you to overcome. He does want you to be victorious in the battles of your life. He truly does. He's for you, not against you. You know, when we see somebody run a marathon and they're at the last stretch, isn't that important to them that oftentimes family members will stand there towards the end of the race, and what do they do? They're cheering them on, right? They're rooting for them. They want them to win. They want them to make it. They want them to get across the finish line. So if you have ever been introduced to a God, whether in your childhood or along the way, who has constantly told you that God is after you to get you, to show you what you've done wrong, or to punish you, or to make you pay for your mistakes and your sins, then I have some news for you this morning. He already did. We're no longer people of the Old Testament. We're people of the New Testament. The blood does not need to be sprinkled on the Ark of the Covenant, on the mercy seat anymore, seven times, which is the number of perfection. That's what the high priest needed to do. Once a year, he went in there with fear and trembling, and he sprinkled the blood on the mercy seat with the cherubim over the, over the mercy seat, meaning that the presence of God was shining down, and for one year, the sins were cleared. Aren't you glad that your sins aren't just cleared for one year? Well, you're okay for 12 months, 365 days, but on 366 and 67 and 68, I'm going to get you. <laughs> but you see, you see, that's right, Joan, it does. But you see, the thing is, that's the kind of message that kind of came across in the, in the Old Testament. There was always fear and trembling. But now there is a redemption, and it's a once and for all redemption. So he gives them assurance, um, intentions. His intentions are good. It is God's sovereign purpose that is behind all of this suffering that has happened over the years. That is not to say that God causes suffering, because what the children, uh, what the brothers have done here was still sin. They sold their brother. But God did all of this for a greater purpose. He let it happen so that in the end, Let's read Genesis 45, 5. Now don't be upset and don't be angry with yourselves that you sold me here. Actually, God sent me before you to save lives. God sent me here. You know, and by the way, this is one of those landmark statements. This didn't take five minutes to figure this one out. It took a long time for Joseph to come to this point to be able to make the statement. You see, God's timing is always perfect. We might not understand it. We might not comprehend it. We don't understand why and in what ways and in, 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 uh, in, in what manner it's going to be resolved. But Joseph didn't know that either all these years. This wasn't a simple process, but it was a long process. And there are other landmark statements in the Bible. I can think of at least two of them that when I say them to you, you will know right away that it's a landmark statement. Jesus made it on the cross. He said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. Do you see the parallel between the two stories here? Father, forgive them for my brothers don't know what they're doing. They haven't even asked for forgiveness yet. 
And then the other one, when Jesus looked at that, um, we assume, a murderer on the cross, because he wouldn't have been on the cross unless it was a capital crime, and he said to him, this day you will be with me in paradise. Now that's a landmark statement. Remember it, don't forget it. This was an incredible moment for Joseph and his brothers because a greater plan shines through all of the mess that the brothers' wrong actions had created are coming now um, and shining through with the purposes of God. In Psalm 105, 17 through 19, I looked this up in the uh, King James Version. This is interesting because this is in the book of Psalms, not in the book of Genesis. He sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant, whose feet they hurt with feathers. He was laid in iron until the time that his word came. The word of the Lord tried him. The word of the Lord does try us. And a matter of fact, our faith is going to be tried. Our faith is going to be tested. Sometimes in manners... Um, way beyond our imagination, like it was in Joseph's case. This wasn't an easy trip. And you know, that's why I put that picture of him in the pit. Because before he get, got to the palace, he spent a lot of time in the pit. And remember how I said there is no easy exit out of a pit? There was no easy exit for Joseph. And um, so I want to um, uh, reflect with you now on several points on the messianic implications, again, like we have throughout this uh, series. So his identity has been concealed from his brothers for years, and that was in order to minister to Egyptians, just as Jesus' identity had been hidden from Jewish brothers while he ministered to Gentiles. And we read about that in Romans 11.25. I don't want you to be unaware of this secret, brothers and sisters, that way you won't think too highly of yourselves a part of Israel has become resistant until the full number of the Gentiles comes in. The Jewish people are going to turn to Jesus. That's the promise. They will recognize Jesus as the Messiah. That's the promise. That's prophetic. But not until the full number of Gentiles has come in. Not until the world, the non-Jews, have heard about the love of Christ and then it says he wept loudly for his brothers, just as Jesus wept for Jerusalem. Let's look up. Isn't that an awesome painting? Jesus overlooking the city of Jerusalem towards the end of his journey. And this is what it says. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stoned those who were sent to you, how often I wanted to gather your people together, just as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings but you didn't want that. Wow, that's serious, isn't it? But you didn't want it. You didn't want to come under those wings that we were just talking about that Boaz was referring to. You know, I love that scripture that, you know, Ruth, you're going to be blessed because you have come under the wings of the God who's going to protect you, who's going to provide for you. And isn't that the image here that Jesus is using? like a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. You want a safe place for yourself? Go under those wings. Open yourself up to the provisions that God has, just like Ruth did in, in the story that we refer to. God's hand uh, in painful circumstances is revealed when Joseph discloses his identity just as God's plan in history will suddenly make sense when Jesus comes again. Romans 11:26. In this way, all Israel will be saved, as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodly behavior from Jacob. So where does the deliverer come from? From Zion. From the Jewish people, like we read. And Israel will be saved, as it is written. And then Joseph forgives his brothers just as Jesus will forgive Israel's rejection of him. Let's read Jeremiah 50, verse 20. In those days and at that time, declares the Lord, if one searches for the sin of Israel, they will find nothing. If one seeks out the wrongdoing of Judah, they will look in vain. I will forgive those I have spared. 
you know what? I can't think of anything more wonderful than to know that in Christ you have total 100% forgiveness of your sins. No questions asked. No buts, no ifs, no maybes, but surely. Surely. And I go back to that Old Testament image again. Seven times the high priest had to sprinkle the blood because seven is completion, seven is perfect. But in a year they had to do it again. Jesus died once for all who believe. And then, just as God worked out Israel's salvation through the treachery of Joseph's brothers, um, just like Joseph acknowledged it and said, don't worry, don't be upset with yourselves, he sent me ahead of you. 22 years. You would have thought, wow, couldn't have God hurried up a bit? Right? Because 22 years in the sight of God is but a millisecond that just passed. But in our lives, it's much more, isn't it? These weren't easy lessons to be learned, neither for him nor for his brothers. God works out the ultimate salvation of the human race through our treachery in killing the Messiah. Let's look at Genesis 45, 7. God sent me before you to make sure you would survive and to rescue your lives in this amazing way. And I love that translation in the Common English Bible. In this amazing way. Everybody say amazing. amazing. It is an amazing way. Who would have thought? Maybe least of them, the brothers, and least of them, Joseph himself, while the process was going on. So Pharaoh welcomes Joseph's brothers and invites the entire clan to move to Egypt. Overwhelming amount of gifts from lack to abundance. Benjamin, five times as much. And in the message translation, it says in 1 Corinthians 2.9, no one's ever seen, and that means no one, or heard anything like this. Never so much as imagined anything quite like it. What God has arranged for those who love him. And I know you love him, don't you? So what's your promise? You haven't seen it, heard it, not even imagined what God has in store for those who love him. Now, if there isn't in the scripture that you can't hold on to, then I don't know if this isn't the one, right? You love him. He's something amazing when he prepares these things for us. So Joseph sends gifts to his father, Let's see Genesis 45, 20. Don't worry about your possessions because you will have good things from the entire land of Egypt. I mean, I don't have anything against any, you know, store chains, but this is going from Dollar General to Saks Fifth. Uh-huh. This is going from Dollar Tree to Harrods. To the biggest department store. This is going from day to, from night to day. This is going from driving in, I'm sorry, I have to point this out. In Hungary, we had this little Fiat. It was uh, made on license uh, in Poland. And in Hungary, they called it asphalt pump pimple. <laughs> they called it an asphalt pimple because it was so small. This is going from the asphalt pimple to a Dodge pickup truck. <laughs> you know, sometimes I go to Europe and uh, I go to a parking garage of a store or something, and uh, people that are in the diplomatic service or whatever, they have an American car, and anything next to it looks small. That's how we have to imagine this. From having nothing to abundance. Isn't that what we are reading here? Isn't that what the promise is? That is the promise. And then reminders needed along the way. Let's go to Genesis 45, 24. It says, he sent his brothers off, and as they were leaving, he told them, don't be worried about the trip. Well, there's another translation I like better. <laughs> and it says, don't quarrel along the way. <laughs> don't be fighting while you are going home. And why? Well, I tell you why. Because they had plenty of reasons to worry. Because let's not forget, now somebody's going to have to break the news to the father what happened 22 years ago. 
Does that give you the chills? It sure gives me the chills. Who is it going to be? Who is going to say to Jacob, to Israel, we really wanted your son dead. We sold him into slavery. And now is the day to fess up. And then, you know, the whole jealousy thing. Benjamin got more than we did. There's a lot that they could be fighting about. And by the way, when you worry, you have a tendency to fight with other people. You do. You're all wound up on the inside, and you're worrying, and you're worrying, and you are, you know, throwing your arrows at people. You have a tendency to fight when you worry. All right. So... Um, then the next thing is, can this be true? They're going home. Their father Jacob finds it hard to believe the news. He finds hard to believe the news. So many questions must have arisen in his heart. And I don't know. I think the biggest one is, how can he forgive his sons? Right? Because let's not forget, for 22 years they left their father, who was suffering because of this loss all his life. He was never the same again. And they watched it happen and didn't do a thing about it. There's going to be a lot of forgiveness that needs to happen here before healing can take place. And then maybe he's wondering, why didn't Joseph contact me all these years? In Genesis 45, 27 through 28, it says, when they told him everything Joseph had said to them, and when he saw the wagons Joseph had sent to carry him, he was looking from the asphalt pimple to the Dodge pickup truck. Right? Right? And all the provisions that came along, and they said, well, if I add all this up, it does make sense what they are saying. It must be true. And he was, I think, 130 years old by this time. No spring chickens. <laughs> Aching joints. He needed assistance to get on the cart. But he said, I think my son is still alive, and I'm going to go and see him. I'm going to go and see him. So, my last, almost last sentence here is, if this isn't a great and mighty deliverance story, I don't know what is. And you see, the wonderful thing is that this is true for us today, just like it was back then. We might not find ourselves in the same situation, but in similar circumstances. And our God hasn't changed. Isn't that what the scripture says? Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's right. And we're finishing with Proverbs 13, 12. Hope delayed makes the heart sick. Longing fulfilled is a tree of life. Jacob's heart was sick. The brothers' hearts were sick, sickened by what they had done. But longing was fulfilled is being fulfilled now, and that's the tree of life. I think it's time for us to underestimate our problems and overestimate the power of God. Let's stand and pray. Lord God, we thank you um, that you speak to us, and we're willing, Lord, to take it in. We're willing to apply it. We're willing to learn from it. Open our hearts and souls as we are participating in communion today, in fellowship, with you, with your Holy Spirit, and with each other. And we pray that you silence our hearts as we move on to that part of our worship service today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're singing together our response hymn number 211, Glorious Things of Thee Are Spoken.
You may be seated. You know, I was talking about uh, um, <clears throat> pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire, uh, which was um, the presence of God uh, while the Israelites were wandering through the desert for 40, 40 years. And uh, the pillar of uh, cloud during the day uh, went ahead and they followed and it showed the presence of God in their midst. And then the pillar of fire during the night when uh, nothing could be seen um, um, manifested the presence of God in their midst. There's so much we can learn from the tabernacle in the Old Testament. The tabernacle was the moving church. And when you look at it, and you look at the tribes, how they were positioned around the tabernacle, it was done in the form of a cross. Back then, the cross was already manifested when you looked at the tabernacle from a bird's eye view. The presence of Christ in the midst of the Old Testament. Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread and said, because you betray me, I'm not going to die for you. That's not what he said. He said, this is the night I will be betrayed, but this is my body, which is broken for you, and do this in remembrance of me. Then he filled the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, and it will be shed for the forgiveness of our sins. So as often as you eat this bread, and drink this cup, you are showing to the world the Lord's death till he comes again, like we read in Romans a moment ago. Let's confess each and every one of us silently to our Lord our sins, and then we'll also confess our faith. Oh, Lord God, your ways aren't our ways. Your thoughts aren't our thoughts. Uh, We thank you that you um, uh, didn't change your mind. Um, You faithfully walked till the very end and fulfilled what God the Father has sent you to do on the face of this earth, which was to lay down your life. And we thank you for that. We thank you that in you we have new beginning, that in you we have forgiveness of sins, that your blood being sprinkled on on the doorposts of our own hearts will make all the difference. We know that we do not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So we are hungry to take it in, and we worship you and thank you for dying for our sins and giving us a new life through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Let's confess our faith by saying the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Um, We do not exclude anybody from taking communion. All we ask is um, to have peace and be right with God, in right standing with God and with your neighbor. And that's all that's required. We do not ask for denominational um, you know, belonging or any of that. Um, just be right with God and be right with your neighbor. Uh, we ask you to hold on to each element, and we take the elements together, first the bread and then the cup. All has been prepared.
body of Christ broken for us. Let us stand and pray together. Well, Lord uh, God, it's true. Um, glorious things of you are spoken. Spoken out loud that we can hear it and in our hearts, Lord. We echo that truth uh, that no one, nothing can compare to your ways, your grace, and your mercy, which you have lavished upon us today again. We worship you and thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. You may return to your seats, and we're going to sing together our closing hymn, number 236, Standing on the Promises.
before we sing the Lord's Prayer. Um, after the service today, I will be available right here in the front for prayer. We do that once in a while after the service, so if you have a prayer request, just feel free to come forward and I'll pray with you. And um, also uh, the benediction. The benediction is uh, from the book of Corinthians. It says, finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Aim for restoration, comfort one another, agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Amen. Mm -hmm.